Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Will Hodgson! Obviously, I'm not going to get barely even got started, started yet. Thanks for, thanks for coming out. Thanks for filling up the front as well, because a lot of the top people sit right in the back. And just a storytelling festival, it's not a comedy club or anything like that. I'm not going to be like sort of picking on people and name calling and stuff. So it's, it's, it's good. Um, this is the the passion of the Hodge. This show is several years old now, and I think it kind of requires a little bit of context rather than going straight into it, because it was a hell of a long time ago, I was kind of different then, there was material that I might not have done now that I was doing at the time. What it, what, I took the, the passion of the Hodgson up to the end of a fringe in 2004, and what it essentially was, was kind of a compilation of everything that I'd written up to that point. I've been doing stand-up for about I guess about two or three years at that point. So it was kind of what I was going to go up and do like a 30 minute double header with someone. But I'm, I live in Chippenham, I what I call the People's Republic of Chippenham. I'm so <laughs> far out of the loop down there that by the time I figured out what to do Edinburgh, everyone in London had kind of like sort of paired up with everyone and done like triple anders and double headers and stuff. I'm frightfully out of the loop in Chippenham. It's pretty much just like the Chippenham scene largely consists of me. Even <laughs> Bristol's a bit kind of seems a bit of a mission and a bit spaced out. If you get down there, so I thought I talked to um, John Oliver, and he said, "Why don't you just like get just rent a room and just go up there and have it, and just kind of just do it for the experience of, do, of doing the of doing the fringe?" So I went to the Holy Room, the Holy Room Tavern, which is the first place that I ever did a spot in the Edinburgh Fringe. I went up first in two thousand one when I was doing So You Think You're Funny, and I'm, I met a guy called Eddie Brimson, who's a brilliant comedian you might have seen about all the clubs and that. He used, to, he used to write books about football, hooliganism and stuff. He did a brilliant show about being an animal rights um, suspected terrorist. That was, um, it was a really, really good really good, good show. Um, if you get a chance to be towards it or whatever, or revives it. But um, he took me to a place called the Holy Room Tavern. That's where I met a guy who's as a legend of the comedy scene in London and in the Edinburgh Fringe. This guy called Brian Damage and his wife, Crystal. And Pear Shaped is one of those... It's, it's a shame it doesn't run anymore. It's one of those great, it's great London. It, it runs in London still. It doesn't run in the Edinburgh Fringe anymore. It's one of those brilliant kind of Edinburgh. One of these things just makes the Fringe brilliant. One of these things you sort of couldn't be kind of touched by a big venue. The Holy Room Tavern was amazing. It's not, it's not a venue anymore. It's kind of like a, a gastro. I can only say gastro in the same sort of contemptuous tone as <laughs> other people say the word paedophile. But that's what they <laughs> that's what they've now turned it into. And it's it's a shame in my opinion. It was my favourite room in the world to play. I did three consecutive Edinburgh Fringe. I did my first one, one there. I mean, what really sad of me was going in there for this year with um, John Robbins and he's, he's another South West comic. I went in there, we had, so it's, it's, it's nice beers and that in. I went in the toilet, what sad of me was the nice pristine toilet. So I just remember, that, <laughs> I remember that awful toilet and doing all these kind of like lengthy sort of like fear shits <laughs> when, I was, when I was doing the first run of the, run of the show. And, I just, I just really, I really miss that place. If it reopened, I'd be back in there, like a, in there, like a, like a, like a, like a shop. I did three, I did three. Is it shut? And I did three years in the, in the, the big, in the Pleasance thing, playing the Michael McIntyre's overspill. They were very really displeased to see you. <laughs> what they want is, it's, it's a fair exchange, really. You know, they go and see sort of snap slick observational comedy by the, by the slickest most professional comedian of his generation what we want is a load of rambling and non-eye contact from a guy with a thick bridge <laughs> <and that>. <laughs> <laughs> understand fair exchange no robbery I'm sure they go just something like just fucking go in there there's a there's comedy going on in there and either you nor him will want the other but if you need to do it so I was one special to me I did this the show with um uh, there's some bits that aren't going to be in the show for various reasons of just kind of practicality. The show itself was sponsored by, this was kind of serious and it wasn't. The show was supposedly sponsored by Buckles, which is a fish and chip shop in Chippenham, <laughs> which is owned by my mate Webby. He's, he's part of like, the, the webs are kind of like Chippenham's equivalent of the Kennedys. <laughs> it's kind of like they're a dynasty in Chippenham. They've got several chip shops, a shoe streets, Buckles, there's other shoe streets, a cafe called 
revolutions. He's a, he's a, he's a nice, nice fellow, Webby. He's, he's, I did do a few sort of like bizarre after dinner things for the webs. <laughs> and some guy will come, some guy with a wig will come, some sort of partridge type will come down from Radio Five Live and do an after dinner, and I'll sort of warm up for for him. I will get away with that. No fucking idea. I think it must be just entirely based on local reference and, su and such like. But um, so. Yeah, they they offered to sponsor the show, and what what we did was because it would be diff we thought we'd do an in, an advert in the middle of the show and have like a, a different comedian come on each time and sample some buckles chips and say how great they were. <laughs> the problem there is buckles not having a branch in Edinburgh. So <laughs> we got around this through the, the magic system of just getting shitload to uh, chip shop bags from Webby's chip shop and then filling them up with chips from the homebrew kitchen. So essentially, not, they actually gave me free chips every single show to take on with me. There's a lot of comedians did it. the Dow did it. Seymour Mace done it. Uh, I can't remember if Kits and done it or not. I don't think he, I don't think he did. John Oliver definitely he did it, Russell Howard definitely done it, and there was a photo, Jimmy Dames well did it as well, I think it's here, in here tonight, it was, it was, it was, it was effective, I'll probably put a lot of weight on from finishing the chips off his, uh, afterwards, the idea was they just eat one and go, hmm, tastes like chipping them, and uh, whether it sold Webby any more chips, I don't know, there was talk that I'd be able to get, there was, there was talk that I'd be able to get a, a burger that I'd be able to design and name it after myself, but this, his dad didn't go, his dad's got 51% of the chips. <laughs> The reason's got 51% of the chip shop to avoid anything like his anything like his son drinking buddies, naming burgers after themselves. And so I thought burger put thought scampi on top of the burger because I think it's expensive. <laughs> is scampi that difficult to make? A lot of the time you go in the chip, you go to go in, you go to buck was go in scampi, go to the or something, I go in, I know you've got scampi, you just can't be fucking doing it like the third. In the, in the evening, so there was that part, it was also, there was music as well. What you've got to remember as well is that, and this is going to sound wanky than actually is, at the time of, one of the reasons this is going to, this has been quite, um, not worrying for me to do this, but I've been kind of like, that breaks about doing a good job, because I, I didn't used to write anything down, I used to commit absolutely everything to memory when I first started doing stand-up, which is a really fucking stupid thing to do if you smoke as much marijuana as I used to back in the early 2000s. And I'm not sort of saying this at all like, oh, I was so stoned back then. I actually had quite a borderline problem we have sort of smoked with smoking this incredibly strong stuff that was grown under under lights by people in chip who never seen the daylight and it was kind of it was a, it's one of sort of like neb and leb and rocky and all these sort of like nice sort of crumbly mellowy sort of giggly things were phasing out there's all this stuff that like gives you pins and needles and half your foot half your body and makes you think you're having a cardiac arrest or a stroke when you've had too much of it and it's so that, that was the reason one of the main reasons that the show featured two renditions of TV themes sung by myself with acoustic accompaniment by Izzy Lawrence. That was the theme from The Gummy Bears and the theme from Heathcliff Cats and Company, which was another two 80s cartoons. I just thought this, I didn't even think that was particularly funny. It seemed like a, sort of, like a, a sort of thing almost like performing sacred songs or hymns to me at the top. At the top. I was very much sort of lo at times lost in a kind of sort of world of fucking like gorillas gusto and AK-47 <laughs> so there, there won't be the gummy bears theme. Oddly enough, I'm not the only comedian who's done the gummy bears theme live. There's a, there's a guy from Harley Green from Melbourne. Not nice place, good comic, but apparently he's got gummy bears tattooed on his on his leg. Other than that, we've got not got very little in common. Uh, <laughs> but he also did the gummy bears theme live. I, I never thought in a million years, because you get crossover with other comedians, whether you're aware of it or not, you might do some it, someone else might do the same thing, even across other sides of like the of the globe and that, but I wouldn't have fucking put money on that this morning, it being the gummy bears theme or Abby. So there's apologies for not having um thing. I was gonna I was gonna get someone was gonna come and do the the music thing, but they just, they couldn't get the time off at work and they felt shit about doing it. So I didn't feel like re re replied. I think I, I felt bad about replacing it, so I'm just not gonna gonna do it. I could have done it in the time I've explained why I'm not gonna, <laughs> why I'm not, why I'm not gonna Going to do it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be some things that are going to be in this show. Some things that aren't going to be. It's going to be sort of something of a. It's got to be, going to be a cross between a sort of the actual show and a bit of a sort of making of the show. So it's kind of. It, I suppose it kind of fits in the story. So it's sort of the story of of a, of a show. And it's, um, it's it's it was a show that kind of um, a lot of sort of thing. It, it did like one it, like won an award. And it had four people in the day after I won it. 
so <laughs> that's <laughs> great. To, absolutely, four people. That was three. That was um, Spoiler from Access Malarkey, and Fox, <laughs> and a couple of other. But my agent, and there was one. There was one other guy after that. So that goes to show you the heights you can scale um, if, you pursue, if you pursue awards and stuff. It was also sort of opera show. I didn't think in a fucking million years I'd come away with anything other than like a massive debt, which I did. Which I did. My mum helped me out with the money she always asked. Done. So doing jokes about care bears isn't exactly a cottage industry. You're, fine, you're never going to become I'm a multi-billionaire over doing that. So my mum's lovely and does sort of help me out and put up my horrendous mood swings and everything I me live above her salon for no money, even though it's probably a bit off-putting for the, the old ladies down there getting blue rings, having me sort of staggering around, sort of tatty, sort of chubby freaks staggering around, wanting to know where the fucking Weight Watchers sausages have got doing everything. So they're all quite an advanced stage, a bit like God's waiting room down there these, these days. I don't think some of them don't quite know what's, what's what, so it's sort of, sort of I can wander about sure as a bit if I, if I want to. They just presume they might be imagining it. We are, what, is, what, is, what she does is she has little sticky label stuck to myself. I thought, I wonder what one of them was. I went up this old woman who was fast asleep under the dryer and said, so the, the sticky label's got her name and her address and like a phone number. It's obviously like the next of kin in case she sort of passes away <laughs> under the drawer. She's like about sort of about like 80, 7, 88 years old. So I think just in case she doesn't come out of this one, they sort of like quietly phone up the Jones, the undertaker, you can just come and just sort of shift there without waking up any of the others, could you? Know, love each other. It's a bit it's a bit like it's a bit like that. And I was still living there at the, at the top. I, mean, I, I remember doing one of the I remember also doing the showcase thing 